Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jennifer Keen. I am a Dean um, of Wilkinson College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences at Chapman University here in Southern California. I'm also a professor of history and um, really looking forward to having an opportunity to talk to you today about one of my favorite themes and, and topics in history, which is how do we understand and correctly interpret historical images? Now, we all carry around in our heads, in a sense, sort of, sort of historic slideshows, if you will. These are, these are sort of shortcuts that we have to how we're going to understand different epics and eras in history. And the image that we have up here, right, as the title slide is a perfect example of that. You see this image of migrant mother, you immediately identify it with the Great Depression and the suffering of ordinary people who are finding themselves in dire circumstances through no fault of their own. And we have these slideshows in our heads and they, they come to signify what historical moments meant and how we understand them in the present. But we never really interrogate them very deeply and that's what I'd like to walk you through today. And my, my idea is that we'll, we'll start with some basic questions, things that we should always be thinking about when we see these images and it will not just help us understand history better, but it will also make us better consumers of images, even in present day society. So I have some questions that I'm gonna walk through as I talk about um, eight key photographers uh, over the 20th century. And the first question that I, I'll be asking is, why did the photographer take the photo? Understanding their motivations, their purpose, their aims, this is really important because as we know, when we read a letter or a book, somebody wrote that. We expect authorship. We know we need to know what somebody's intent really was. But often when we see an image, it seems like a snap of reality. It doesn't, it doesn't occur to us to really ask who took it and why did they take it? And that's what I wanna really interrogate today. The, the second question I'm gonna pose is, what role did the subject play uh, in, the, in the making of the photograph? For most of the 20th century, cameras were bulky. You couldn't really just you know, whip out a phone and, and, and secretly tape somebody. Most people understood that they were being photographed. So why did they agree to it? Not everybody had a choice, but in some ways the subjects often play a role. And the final question is really the, the main topic of today, which is, what impact do photographs have to really alter the course of history? Um, what impact did they have at the time? What do they come to signify after the fact? And how do images get reinterpreted and repurposed in a way to help us shape our national narrative and our understanding of who we are? What I'm gonna hope is that by the end of this lecture, <laughs> you come to, to believe as I do that often the story behind the images as interesting as the, as the image itself. And, and in a sense, we, we've all heard this phrase, it, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, but I'm going to counter by arguing that in fact, it really takes a thousand words to correctly understand an image. Okay, so who are we gonna talk about today? I'm gonna to be talking about eight American photographers uh, spanning from the 1890s to the 1960s. And these are going to be Jacob Rees, Louis Hine, James Vanderzee, Dorothea Lang, Ansel Adams, Joe Rosenthal, Charles Moore, and Eddie Adams. So sit down, if you're probably already sitting, and we'll go ahead and get started. So the first person that I want to start with is Jacob Rees. And many of you might already be familiar with Jacob Rees. Jacob Rees was a Danish immigrant who came to the United States in 1870. And by the 1890s, he was a reporter working in New York City. And he, he had the idea of pioneering a new technique of photojournalism. Jacob Rees ended up publishing a book, How the Other Half Lives. A lot of his photographs were reproduced as engravings in that, in that book because the technology was not yet uh, there to be able to replicate photographic images. But he went around New York City and, and gave lantern slide lectures of the images that he had taken. And in that way really brought to the people the message that he wanted through imagery. And Jacob Rees was operating during the progressive era. He was, he was himself a progressive reformer. He was interested in thinking about 
how American society could be improved because the progressives at the end of the 19th century were very concerned about what they saw as negative trends in, Amer in American society. Two extremes. On the one extreme, monopolistic capitalist practices were creating this super wealthy class that seemed completely disconnected from the rest of the, of the US. And on the other hand, you had radical socialist anarchist movements that were taking hold among the populace, which seemed another extreme. Where was the middle ground? And so in sort of seeking this middle ground and looking to finding solutions to social problems of poverty, of tenements, of child abuse, of alcoholism, of lack of competition in the marketplace, the progressives turned to, to defining a new role for government and in particular local government. And this is where Reese fit in because Reese had a pretty single-minded pursuit and that was tenement reform. To him, the idea of the, the idea that in New York City, you could have so many hundreds of thousands of residents living in such dilapidated circumstances to him, this was the heart of many of the other social ills that the city was suffering from. So he set out to change people's minds and he did it by taking people on a tour of the tenements, a photographic tour to make them see truly how the other half lived. Now, one of his most famous, and he has several actually uh, famous iconic images. One of his most famous was his images of, of children whom he called street Arabs. And these were children who were abandoned to the streets. They had either run away from home or their parents had kicked them out of the houses. But there were these little armies of children who roamed, who roamed the streets begging, stealing, really learning to make it on their own. And you can just take a look at this image really closely and to see how it, it would tug on the heartstrings, especially of the middle class audience that Reese was trying to, to reach. Um, you have these small, small boys, they're cuddled up for warmth, they're, they're, they have no shoes, they look cold, hungry. These are, these, are, these, are, these are definitely children that you feel in your heart you want to reach out and help. And it's important to note that Reese's audience, the middle-class audience that he was trying to connect with, by this point had, a, had developed very clear ideas of what childhood should be. And not a time where you learned to be a mini adult, but instead a time of innocence, a time when you should be free of the cares of the world. It should be a time devoted to education, to play, to really, to really cultivating um, a full life. And, and if you juxtapose the image that Reese was taking of these, of these small children ab abandoned to the streets with advertising of the error, you can just see the sort of mental connection that his audience would make and how wrong it would seem that these children born into circumstances beyond their control could never hope to have the same kind of life as this young girl just in a carefree way, taking a bicycle ride down a country lane. And so the idea of helping innocent victims, I mean, this is always very appealing to many reform movements, but Reese was also warning people. And he was warning them that today these are innocent children on the streets without, with, who, are, who are really, uh, in a sense, helpless to help themselves, but one day they would grow up. And what kind of adults would they grow up to be? And this is where the tenements and the kinds of conditions that prevailed there really came into his story. Because in a certain sense, there were different paths that a child could take, right? They could take a, take a path to a productive life or they could fall into a, a life of crime, degeneracy. And we can see that in trying to help people understand what they were seeing, Reese did not just leave it up to your own interpretation about what an image actually meant. He gave lectures, he wrote lots of words, he, he directed you in a sense on this journey that he was taking you on through the tenements. And this picture of, of a trash filled courtyard is a perfect example of this. Because if we look at this picture, in a way, it, it doesn't tell us very much about how this situation has come to be. 
I mean, after all, who do we blame here? Do we blame the, the inhabitants of the tenements for uh, not having any self-respect, for not taking care of where they live, for just chucking trash all over the place? Um, or do we blame the landlord who doesn't provide any garbage collection for, for the residents there, who give them no choice but to, in a sense, just dispose of trash however, however, they, however they like? Who's to blame here? Is it the landlord or is it the tenements? Well, Reese would actually prefer that we put this, this together a little bit differently. And he argued that in this environment, what you're going to see is a self-perpetuating cycle of poverty. Because by, by putting people in these kind of living conditions, you begin to shape their character. Even a self-respecting person will soon lose the, the will, the drive to continue to maintain a, a standard of, of decent living if placed in this kind of environment. And that, and that the character will gradually become uh, people who feel no responsibility to their neighbors, who don't feel a duty to take care of where they live, and will, and will themselves just find, them, find themselves sort of spiraling down the socioeconomic ladder. And in, in his tour of the tenements, he, he looked down, he looked down at the trash, but he also looked up and he looked up at, at laundry. Laundry was a big thing for Jacob Rees. And it was really here that he saw hope because it was these people struggling against all odds to keep their houses clean, to, 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 to clean their clothes and, and, and to think of what it meant to do laundry in the tenements. I could, go, I could take 10 minutes just explaining to you about how, how hard and difficult that, that was, that these were the honest poor. These were the people that, that Jacob Reese was arguing needed to be, needed to be helped. Um, with it, be, he says, he, he always says the true line to be drawn between pauperism and honest poverty is the closed line. With it begins the desire to be clean that is the first and best evidence of a desire to be honest. And it was this honest and hardworking poor that Reese wanted to help. And his photographs were very influential along with his writings. He did help. We did see tenement reform coming in to New York City. Um, uh, new regulations that were going to provide these kind of healthier places to live that Reese was arguing for. So Reese starts us off in this story with this kind of new idea of how you could use photography to enact social reform, has an immediate impact in where, in where he lives, and doesn't do it in a way that, that argues that government is the only way that you can solve these problems, but instead speaks to the importance of you seeing how other people live to empathize with them so that you can support solutions to help them improve their own lives. Right. Now, our next, our next photographer, Lewis Hine, sort of continued in this tradition of, of Jacob Rees by really thinking about how could photographs be used very purposefully to further a social reform movement. Like Rees, Lewis Hine was also operating in the time of the progressive movement, but, but he had a, a different cause and also a very different approach to how he used photographs. So Reese was, was really connecting to older traditions of charity, idea of Christian charity, fears of the poor, what would these children turn out to be as adults to really change for, for to press for changes in municipal housing laws. Lewis Hine, however, was a sociologist and he was operating in a new field of data collection. In sociology, we're used to this as an academic field now, but this was just coming into being at the beginning of the 20th century. And the sociologists, they relied on more than good intentions. It wasn't enough just to feel sorry for children. You also had to be thinking about making policy based on good data. Um, you wanted hard statistics, you wanted surveys done, you wanted to understand the population and the correlations between um, poverty, say for example, and wages or disease and clean running water. These were all the types of studies that, that um, a lot of progressives were doing in the early 20th century to try to argue not just about good intentions, guiding policy, but actual, actual sociological surveying. 
And Lewis Hine comes in and argues that photography can aid in this effort, that it's not just about numbers, but you can also do photographic surveys that show you the, the range of the problem, the depth of the problem, and also point to some, some ways to, to solve it. And the particular problem that he was interested in was child labor. He worked for 10 years for the National Child Labor Committee and undertook a survey, a photographic survey of all of the different uh, working conditions, the, all the different ways that, that children are being employed by industry, uh, factories, as well as agricultural industry across the United States. And he took nearly 5,000 photographs. And he did not mean for these to be anecdotal. He meant for them this really to be a sort of comprehensive, uh, data-driven approach to taking photographs that would help put facts behind good intentions here. Unlike Reese, for example, uh, Lewis Hine always took special care to document where he was, who he was photographing, um, and, 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 and dates and times. And so, so anything that, that, that he, he was documenting could be verified. He was, he was very concerned. You, could see by the quote that I started the section with, that he would be accused of posing his subjects, something I should add that Jacob Priest did, did occasionally do, that he'd be accused of man manufacturing stories. And so he wanted to always be able to verify the facts behind every image, image, every image that he that he that he took. Now, I always found it really interesting about Lewis Hine that while he had this sort of heavy emphasis on facts and being, being able to verify the truth behind the images that he took, he himself was a liar <laughs> because he had to lie all the time in order to gain access inside these factories to take the images that he took. Uh, as you can imagine, he can't be knocking on the door and saying, hello, I'm here from the National Child Labor Committee. Could I come in and document the abusive conditions in which children are laboring inside your factory? No, he had to, he had to develop um, uh, personas. And so he would pose as a fire inspector or a postcard vendor. Sometimes he's a Bible or insurance salesman. He comes up with all of these different ruses to be able to get into factories and take the kind of, the kind of images uh, that he took. This is one of his most iconic images. Again, like Reese, he has more than one, but this is one that we see a lot. And if we look at the caption that he has uh, to accompany this image, you get a sense of how this kind of factual approach that he likes. Uh, Sadie Pfeiffer, Lancaster Cotton Mill, South Carolina, 48 inches high. You, know, you might wonder, how does he know she's 48 inches high? He, he had actually uh, used the buttons on his coat that would stand up against the child and had a, and a sense of, of how, much, how high each one was. Um, worked as a spinner for six months, repairing breaks or snags in the machine spun thread. So fact, she existed. Fact, she was working here. But of course, the power of this image is not just in that information. It's in Heinz's art, artistic skill. Because what really is compelling about these, this image and many of the images that he, uh, that he took is the way that he was really able to symbolize what being a child laborer wants. This small child looks absolutely dwarfed by this, this, this massive machine. She's sticking her hands into it. Anybody who's childproofed a home is probably cringing right now to be thinking of how dangerous this is. She's relatively isolated. The picture doesn't convey the, the noise in the, in the room, but we can only imagine that it's deafening. She's being supervised by an adult, um, and we get this long perspective of the sort of hopelessness of her, of her day. And so there's a lot going on in this photograph beyond the sort of survey elements where Lewis Hine, by being such a skilled photographer, really also does convey a lot of emotion through his, through his images. And we can see this through some of the others where again, um, just cringeworthy, right? No, no shoes, this small child climbing onto this, onto this machine. Um, and another child injured in a coal mining accident uh, who loses his leg at only 13 years old. What, what life is he possibly going to have before him? Now, it is important always not just to look at the photographer's intent and, and the symbolism of the image and, and what, 
the purpose of the image was in the minds of the person who, who took it. It's also important that we think about who saw it, who, how was it communicated? Reese, I mentioned, had his lantern slide lectures, wrote a book. We know that his images were in wide circulation. Lewis Hine, by working for the National Child Labor Committee, also is able to get his images into circulation and doesn't so much use lantern slide lectures, but they also tend to use these, these poster boards here where they create these montages of images uh, with some pretty heavy handed captioning to really make sure that their intent was clearly articulated. And here you can see some facts here on uh, nearly 2 million children under the age of 16 years old working in the United States, sometimes as much as 12 hours a day. And the, and the, and, and the, and the conveying of the, the view here that this is a national problem. This is not just one community's problem or one bad industrialist. This is a national crisis. And as a national crisis, it requires a national solution. And what these reformers really wanted was they wanted federal laws that set parameters or outlawed, outlawed outright child labor. They were, Reese was focused on the municipal level. They were focused on the national level. And they had a lot of opposition to overcome. It might seem so obvious to us now, especially by looking at these images, of course we don't want children to be working in these conditions, but actually this was controversial. But just like, like Reese's image of the courtyard, you couldn't make an unnatural assumption there was only one way to interpret that image. There was not one way to interpret these images of child labor. Um, in, industrialists, employers were, were against these laws, they argued, that these were children of the working class. They were destined to be workers in their, in their adult lives. What better education for them than to start young? They would, they would get disciplined, they would learn skills, this would give them a leg up, that actually this was exactly the kind of education that, that they needed. Um, and you also had parents who were against a lot of these laws because they argued that the it was, they were their children, they could decide what their children did, and their income was necessary for many working class families to make ends meet. And so, so the, the arguments that had to be overcome were, were not just from the factory owners, they were from the parents themselves. And it, it was, a, it was, it was, a, it was a, a situation in which interpreting the meaning of those photographs that was that was really the the crux of the campaign uh, underway, and so you can see, and I'm sure I don't want to need to read this to you uh, as I'm speaking. You can read it for yourself, but you can see the kind of arguments that they were putting forth. That in fact, these that child labor ruined these kids' lives. That it became a vicious cycle of poverty, and that it was not just about helping these individual children, but all of society bore the cost of this, and that it was really a way. A, a proper thing for the government to step in um, and take charge of because it was a way to protect the public good, not just uh, influence individual lives here. These uh, images were very persuasive. Congress did pass anti-child labor laws in 1916 and 1918, but they were overturned by the Supreme Court as infringements on state rights and also as laws that infringed upon children's right to, um, for, to contract their own labor. It wasn't until 1938, when we have the Fair Labor Standards Act as part of the New Deal, that we see uh, we see the limitations on a federal level being placed on, on child labor, and then some expansions of those laws um, after World War II. So while we see that this campaign did not overnight become resolved because of the images that Lewis Hine uh, crafted, we definitely see a different approach to how photograph photography can be used to really help people understand the scope of a of a social problem here. Yeah. Okay, so our next our next uh, photographer is James Van Der Zee, and James Van Der Zee is very different from Jacob Rees and Lewis Hine because he is not interested in social reform. James Van Der Zee is a photographer who photographs during the Harlem Renaissance, and he's somebody who 
is really trying to change uh, the image that a community has of itself. And so his intent is not to get laws passed. It's not to have middle-class uh, white Americans see uh, black Americans uh, dramatically differently. He's really thinking about how black Americans understand themselves. And the context of him, his images really comes with an American culture that is saturated with racist, uh, demeaning, stereotypical images of African Americans. Uh, and, and what James Vandersey wants to do is not so much worry about is this the literal truth, he's thinking more about the kinds of ways that photography can help you see yourself and your community differently. And so what we see in his images, here's a really famous iconic image of J James Van Der Zee's of this uh, couple wearing raccoon uh, fur coats uh, in, a, in a beautiful car in, in Harlem. He's really trying to help people see themselves as, as prosperous, as, uh, as beautiful, as, as, as stylish. And this becomes a way of, of really internalizing many attributes of the Harlem Renaissance, which emphasize the vitality of African-American culture and the, the beauty in African-American life and racial pride. And these were themes that we would see in James Van Der Zee's photographs again and again and again. So while there's plenty of poverty in Harlem and it would have been easy for him to take images similar say to the kind of images that Jacob Reese was taking, James Van Der Zee in his neighborhood has a completely different purpose. And so the images that come out are very different. And he's, 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 he's thinking about the political moment as well as the cultural moment. James Van Der Zee is the official photographer for Marcus Garvey, who was a leader of the United Negro Improvement Association. And this was a radical civil rights group that was really emphasizing black economic empowerment and racial pride. And Marcus Garvey himself, uh, very intentionally wore the attire of, of a king, a general. He, he, he argued, if you, if you wear these things, you force our community and others around us to actually look at us differently. And in wearing this, this kind of regalia, you know, sometimes he got mocked uh, even by others in the civil rights movement, but he had a really interesting response. And this is Marcus Garvey. He says, we've outgrown slavery, but our minds are still enslaved by the thinking of the master race. Now take those kinks out of your mind instead of out of your hair. And so Van der Zee was representing here an ideology and a way of thinking and a, and a kind of self-empowerment that was really encapsulated in much of the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s. And so he was certainly documenting a truth. But with Van der Zee, we can't get too worked up about, is this really somebody's car? Is this really somebody's dress? Is this really somebody's house? Because that wasn't his truth. His truth actually lay elsewhere. Um, and we can see really in terms of the documentation that he offered, how he was trying to represent Harlem in a completely different way um, and operated in the vein of normal studio photography. It was not uncommon at the time for you to go down to have your portrait taken and for the photographer to have very nice things for you to put on that were not yours because don't we all like to be well represented in the photographs um, that we take. So Dorothea Lange, uh, we started with one of, one of her images, is, is definitely one of the most famous photographers in American history. Dorothea Lang, more similar to Jacob Reese and Lewis Hine, working in a sort of reform tradition to try to use photography to enact social change. I put her more with Lewis Hine than Jacob Reese because she also developed that sort of survey approach, really using her photographs to document uh, actual conditions for agricultural workers throughout the United States in the, 19, in the 1930s. She's hired by the Farm Security Administration to undergo this documentary project. And if you go around the country with her photographs, you'll see very different conditions, whether she's photographing in California with the corporate farming uh, situation in the South with sharecropping and tenant farming, or in, the, or in the Midwest panhandle where it's really drought that, that, that she focuses on. So you get a real sense of the diversity of the crisis if you look at her images. But her most famous image, Migrant Mother, which is taken out in California, really defined her, uh, her genre and also 
resulted in, in what's got to be one of the most famous and iconic photographs of all time. Now, when we see this image of migrant mother, we're immediately drawn to this woman's suffering, this sense of, of, of her despair with these children who depend on her uh, and, and that she does not seem uh, able to provide for. It's, it's, it's iconic, it's, it's tragic, it, the artistic composition is phenomenal. I mean, this photograph is a masterpiece. It's, it's, there's just no other way to, uh, to understand it. But it wasn't created in a vacuum and it wasn't even created by accident. When we look at the composition of it, we can see, if we think back to Western uh, art tradition, that in, in order to send the message that, that this woman and her children and people like her are deserving of our compassion and are deserving of government aid, which was ultimately her point, to be trying to drum up public support for New Deal programs aimed at agricultural workers, she was not operating in an artistic vacuum. In fact, we can see very clearly that the composition of this image harks back to the Madonna and child imagery that's so prevalent in Western civilization, both first in actual art and then even Jacob Rees and Lewis Hine, very influenced by that compositional structure. So right away there, it's tapping into something that we're predisposed to see. But Migrant Mother was not the the first image that she took when she came upon this, this woman and her children in a pea pickers camp, um, it was actually the last of six. And maybe in our day and age, that seems amazing that she could get to migrant mother with just six exposures. I mean, I know we all look at our iPhones and see we have 50 pictures of our children and we can't get one that's right. So maybe there, this, is, this is something to be celebrating at her as well. But it also shows if we look at, at the progression of how she takes Margaret Mother, that she, she just says knows what she's looking for and she knows when she doesn't have it. So her first shot, uh, which we have here, is not really an image that conveys near, nearly the power of the, of the final one, of the final migrant, migrant mother image. Yes, it shows poverty. Yes, it shows that these, this is a family in distress, but there's also a lot of other parts of the image that may not make us immediately willing to, uh, to help. For one thing, uh, it's kind of a mess. There's trash all over the place. There's a lot of kids. I mean, why is she having all these kids? Where's the man of the house? Has she been abandoned? There's kind of just disarray and a distancing. So we might, we feel a barrier here. There's an othering in a sense of this family and, and their plight. But quickly as she begins to compose the uh, photograph, she hones in and she, she starts looking more for the portraiture aspect of conveying this family's uh, uh, pr plight. This one, we see her getting a little bit closer. And then of course, the masterpiece image here uh, by the time we get we get to get to the end. And and this is such night and day. And again, remember, this is the first, this the this is just the sixth image um, that she's taken of this family. She's only stops by the side of the road for about 20 minutes, gets what she needs, gets in the car, and leaves. It it does have an immediate impact. It's published in the paper. Uh, 20 thousand pounds of food are immediately sent to the area to help relieve these, these starving pea pickers um, who are camped by the side of the road. But this particular woman, Florence Thompson, never gets any of that food. By the time that food arrives, her family has already packed up and left. And she, in fact, never receives any government aid over the course of the entire, the entire depression. For years, nobody knew this woman's name. In fact, Dorothea Lang didn't even think to ask this woman her name, uh, which says a lot to us. And in 1960, Lang recounted the, the whole experience this way. I saw and approached the hungry and desperate mother as if drawn by a magnet. I do not remember how I explained my presence or my camera to her, but I do remember she asked me no questions. I made five exposures working closer and closer from the same direction. She actually made six. I did not ask her her name or her history, right? That's interesting, right? She never even asked her to that. There she sat in that lean-to tent with her children huddled around her and seemed to know that my pictures might help her. And so she helped me. There was a sort of equality about it. Now that was Lang's memory. 
But in the 1970s, a reporter finally decided, hey, I wonder who this woman is, and went out to, to find her and did, and discovered that she was Florence Thompson, and she'd been born in Oklahoma. She was a full-blooded Cherokee. Something, if, if that had been known at the time, might have precluded uh, government, the government agencies from actually circulating her image. And she didn't recall it the same way at all. In fact, to her, she was mad. She was angry that this image was so widely uh, circulated. She felt that it stigmatized her as poor. It stigmatized her as need, needy and, and being helped by government programs that she had never touched. Her memory of her time in the Great Depression was completely different, that she had pulled herself up by her own bootstraps. She had taken care of her family. Nobody had helped her do that. And she felt exploited. And this gives us, in a sense, some really interesting um, things to think about when we look at these iconic images. Who has the power to interpret them and to control the meaning? And in this particular case, this woman who had her picture taken was powerless. She could not stop it from being circulated. She could not stop people from interpreting a certain way. And she felt completely disconnected from the narrative that others had imposed on her life story just through the way that they, they understood the symbolism of, of migrant mother. And so, so this, is, this is something to think about when we think about what does this picture actually represent. Now another pretty famous photograph um, that, that soon follows on the heels of migrant mother comes uh, near the end of World War II with Joe Rosenthal, who all, whose image also raises some really interesting questions about how images are created and how they're understood. And so images, uh, Joe Rosenthal's very famous image um, of the, uh, excuse me, raising of the flag, of the American flag on Mount Suribachi uh, at the very beginning of the, the Battle of Iwo Jima on February 23rd, 1945, this, this image also, like Migrant Mother, is probably you know, in the top two uh, of iconic images that seem to sum up uh, as, as succinctly as possible a moment in time and, 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 and in some senses a whole event. And so this image of six Marines uh, pushing the flag upright on Mount Suribachi, it's, it's, in, it's emblematic and it's, it's iconic in, in so many ways. It, it, it symbolizes teamwork that's needed to defeat Japan. We don't see these men's faces, so it gives a sense of represent, representation of, of all of the servicemen in the Pacific. Because the flag is, is not all the way upright, it's sort of being pushed up, it gives the sense that the struggle's not, not over yet. And and if you know anything about the, the men involved, the fact that three of them will not actually survive the war adds, adds to even more emotional impact to the, to the image. But, but mostly I think one of the reasons why this particular image endures is that it seems to encapsulate everything we believe to be true about World War II, which was that it was in fact the good war. And the image of the good war is, is strong in, in American history and this image all of its symbolism seems to support that interpretation of, of, the, of the conflict here. But there were controversies around this image. And one of the, the first controversies was that uh, it was the second flag raising that Rosenthal was photographing, not the first one. There had been a flag placed on Mount Suribachi earlier in the day. And this was cheered by the men on the shore who were doing the landing um, to really, you know, sort of a morale boosting moment to say, okay, we, 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 we take in the hill. And, and, uh, and that one was photographed by Lou Lowry. We have a little, a little bit image here of them walking up the hill. And then we can see Lou Lowry's image with the first flag waving. Now this flag was small. It was, it was later decided to take it down and send a, another group up to put a larger flag up, uh, which is the one that Joe Rosenthal accompanied. And you can see, of course, back to, back to the iconic image. And then a second image that Rosenthal took, uh, which was right afterwards posed. Now, two controversies here. The first is, why is it Lowry's image, the image that we remember? Because that's actually the first flag raising, so sort of a little bit of a tiff 
over that one. And then the second controversy, which came over the question of posing, because when asked by a reporter, did you pose the image, Rosenthal thought that the reporter was asking about the second image, not the first image, and answered yes. And that yes answer uh, dogged him until his dying days. Even in his obituary, people were still writing and wondering, had he posed the famous iconic image? Um, and he could never shake it, despite the, uh, the uh, explanations that he, that he offered here. But the other controversy uh, also spoke to the specificity of the image, and that was the question of who was in the image. And as many of you may know, there was a book written um, by one of the supposed uh, men in the, in the, in the image, um, John Bradley, and his son wrote a book called Flags of Our Fathers in, in 2000, and it was turned into a movie. And the idea here was about his father, who had been part of this, this moment in history and, and how just his whole experience in the Second World War had ruined his life and affected the family. And it was, you know, really traumatic personal story. But it turned out from later research that Bradley actually was misidentified in this, in this photograph and was not actually there. And in fact, three of the individuals who had been originally identified as being part of this group have now been determined to not be there. Does it really matter to us in terms of understanding what this image symbolizes about World War II, who is actually in it? The, according to the Marine Corps, probably not. Simply stated, this was the press release they, they, they issued after determining that John Bradley was not in the image. Simply stated, our fighting spirit is captured in that frame and it remains a symbol of the tremendous accomplishment of our core. What they did together and what they represent remains most important. That doesn't change. And we can see this image is everywhere. We can't get away from it. It has had a tremendous impact on American history. Now I wanna move rather quickly through Ansel Adams. And Ansel Adams was also taking pictures during World War II. And these were not images that were widely seen at the time. And they have been you know, seen more since, but again, nowhere near the same, to the same extent as Joe Rosenthal's image. But they're important for us to consider because they're images that directly uh, challenge this idea of World War II as the good war. And you might be expecting me to talk about Yosemite his famous images <laughs> of Half Dome. But the images I wanna show you are images that Ansel Adams took um, of Manzanar, which was a Japanese American internment camp in the Sierra Nevadas in California. And he gained access to Manzanar in 1943. And this was an important moment in the Japanese American internment experience because a questionnaire had just been issued and those Japanese Americans who had answered a, a handful of questions incorrectly and been deemed disloyal had been removed from the camp and they had been segregated in a, in a, different, in a different camp. And so the, the, the people that Ansel Adams was seeing had in a sense been verified as loyal through the answers they had given to this questionnaire. And he's taking these images in 1943 at a moment where people are starting to leave the camps. If students could find colleges that would welcome them or businesses that would hire them away from the West Coast, uh, if they were going into the military, they were going to be allowed to leave. And Ansel Adams' intent here in taking these images was to change the portrait of Japanese Americans as so dangerous and so foreign that citizen, non-citizen, baby, uh, elderly, everybody in this community had to, be, had to be forcibly removed and quarantined in an armed camp to change the conception of who these people were to one that made them as American as apple pie, that if they came back to your community, there was nothing that you needed to fear. And so if we look at the images that Ansel Adams was taking, they're rather benign images. If you didn't know that context, what would you see? Some bored teenagers in class, that's very, nothing more American than that. I can attest, I can attest to that one here. Uh, industrial hard work, um, town government, you know, local governance, again, all the attributes that we would associate with the American way of life. Um, but the bulletin board where the job announcements are being placed, help us put these images in, into context. These are people who may be, you know, in, in the war's not over yet, returning to civilian communities. Um, 
And in trying to rehabilitate this image of Japanese Americans as patriotic, Christian, um, uh, you know, completely assimilated in terms of language uh, and, and, and their, their cultural habits. But there's a lot in these images that he's also not able to show. He's not able to show the armed guards. He's not able to show the barbed wire. He's not able to show anger. And there was plenty of anger in the Japanese American community. There had been a riot just before he came to the camp. Uh, Japanese Americans were filing lawsuits that were going to go all the way up to the Supreme Court to question the constitutionality of internment. There's a lot that's not in these images. And so while we understand the context and we can, we can see how they're challenging to the notion of the good war and that ultimately these are images that do help lead to reparations and an apology from the government about how Japanese Americans were interpreted, we can't see them as telling the whole story because in fact they're not. And it's that theme of, of what's left out of photographs um, that I wanna pick up it with Charles Moore because Charles Moore also in photographing the American civil rights movement made some important decisions, not because the government was telling him what to photograph and not, to, what, not what to photograph as was the case for Ansel Adams, but because of his own uh, knowledge about how taking all the photographs of everything that he saw, everything that he was experiencing could in fact damage the cause that he was becoming sympathetic to. So Charles Moore was somebody who was in Birmingham in 1963 uh, during the really famous civil rights protests there. And Birmingham had been very intentionally selected by the civil rights movement as a place for a civil rights protest because much of the civil rights movement was uh, strategic in terms of thinking about going to places where they could stage image events that would be photographed by the press and that these images would be disseminated by the mainstream media and, ho and hopefully they would be received sympathetically by Northern whites who would then put pressure on John F. Kennedy to, uh, to enact civil rights legislation. And in going to Birmingham, again, this was part of a, a strategic decision because Birmingham had a uh, police chief, Bull Connor, who was, they felt was guaranteed to overreact as he did. And, and they would get the images and the sort of uh, press coverage that they were hoping to receive that would be beneficial to, to the cause. Now, in May 1963, in these sort of iconic protests that we see in Charles Moore, Southern uh, photojournalist working for Life magazine, where he's taking, he sees what's unfolding and he takes this image, which, we, which most of us have seen, takes it, again, another famous image of the police dogs being unleashed on, on protesters. He, he's creating the images that, that are going to benefit the, mo the movement. And we do see that, that from these images, John F. Kennedy is moved. He does introduce civil rights legislation in a sense. It all kind of goes according to plan. It's exactly what, what the movement wanted to see happen. But what Charles Moore decided not to take a picture of is also significant because a lot of the demonstrators uh, uh, that day were high school students. Um, and there, there are a lot of reasons why high school students were the ones that were recruited um, in part because a lot of adults, it was difficult for them to participate in the protests, fearful of losing their jobs, not sure what the repercussions for their families would be. Uh, high school students, very young, very enthusiastic, but poorly trained, poorly trained in nonviolent civil uh, disobedient tactics. And so on that day, as these things are happening to them, they're getting you know showered with fire hoses, dogs are coming after them, the police are hitting them, they get angry. And some of these teenagers pick up rocks and start throwing them back at the police. And in fact, one of those rocks actually hit Moore in the leg, injured a tendon, and he's in pain for the entire day. Now, if Moore had turned his camera and decided to take images of rock throwing youth at police, well, this interpretation of Birmingham on the national scale could have been completely different because then instead of images of the police overreacting in this, in this ridiculous way and, and sympathy staying firmly on the side of the protesters, there could have been those, uh, arg those it could, there could have been that those arguing that the police were justified in these tactics actually had some photographic evidence to present. And, and this is in fact what happened just two years later in, in Watts during the riots where police brutality is, at, is what sparks this civil unrest. But in these cases, the idea of 
of the violence of the crowd is what becomes emphasized and, and public sympathy is clearly going onto the side of the police and the firefighters and the unrest is interpreted completely differently. And so in this sense, we see that the photographer really has um, power in the situation, right? What do you decide to take a photograph of? What, what is missing from the photograph? And how does that in fact uh, interpret our understanding of the event? Now, the very last photographer that I wanna to touch on really briefly is Eddie Adams, because he offers a counter to everything I've just said, which is that sometimes the photo photographer completely loses control of the image and is not able to dictate um, what, what happens. And Eddie Adams is the photographer who takes this very famous image um, on the second day of the Tet Offensive during the Vietnam War. And the Tet Offensive occurs in January of 1968. This is a, a massive uh, a, a assault by the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. Um, it was a surprise attack over a hundred cities and towns. And, and, and even there were uh, some Viet Cong who temporarily occupied the US Embassy in Saigon during the Tet Offensive. And in the, in the midst of this, or at the height of it, when it's, it's not clear how the Tet Offensive is gonna go, ultimately it's a military failure for, for the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. Eddie Adams takes a picture of a Vietnamese chief of national police, General Lone, uh, executing a Viet Cong suspect uh, in the middle of the street. And it's, it's a, in some ways like Margaret Mother, uh, uh, like uh, Joe Rosenthal's image of Irojima, this kind of um, unbelievable moment in time. It's, it's kind of incredible that Eddie Adams got this shot. If you look at the, the sequencing of his film before and after, you can see that there seems to be almost a kind of accidental quality to it in terms of him being able to capture the moment of this man's death uh, so, so clearly. But what was obviously so important as well was that to many people in seeing this image, it seemed to encapsulate everything that was wrong with the Vietnam War. Instead of people uh, seeing uh, Lone as justified in carrying out this, this, this execution, which was what Lone argued and actually even what Adams argued, the American public seized on this image as emblematic of everything that was wrong, that this was an unjust war, it was, it was being fought against the, the rules of war, that, that it was corrupt, and, and the Tet Offensive, by also demonstrating that, that this was an unwinnable war to, in many people's minds, signaled the, the turn in public opinion against the conflict. But for Eddie Adams, this was a shock because he saw Lone as justified. He was killing a, a guerrilla chief. It turned out that this, this man was in fact, uh, you know, somebody who had just committed atrocities against, against uh, South Vietnamese. And also Lone told Adams if his willingness to do this in front of his men inspired them to know that he was on their, on their side. If, I, if you don't take strong action, he told Adams, your men will not lead them. And to Adams, Lone was never the man that was depicted in that execution photograph. And all the other images that Adams took of Lone showed him as a beloved commander, a kind man, somebody who did what he had to do in the heat of battle. And in a different historical moment, in a different war, that might have been a view of him that stuck, but not in Vietnam. And in this sense, for Adams, he regretted taking that photograph because he felt it misrepresented the individual at, at the heart of it rather than captured, captured his essence here. All right. So this has been a lot. Thanks for sticking with me through this journey of, of eight different photographers and the ways in which uh, iconic photographs have been created, processed, and, and understood. Um, and I, I think that through all of this, we can, we can realize that why somebody takes a photograph uh, matters, what ability a subject has to influence or control the photograph matters, but probably the entity that matters the most at the end of the day are you and I, because it's how those photographs are interpreted, how they're understood, that give them the power at the time that they're taken, and also give them their power to shape our understanding of the historical narrative. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions.
I already see some really wonderful questions here in the chat. Uh, hopefully we'll have time to get to as many as possible. And uh, I have to say, just sort of skimming over them, impressive questions. These are, these are questions in some respects that in a course that I teach, uh, images of American history, we spent pretty much the whole semester in investigating. So just to kind of start with this first question up here about the moral dilemma that photographers often face, especially those photographers who are trying to um, uh, photograph uh, combat or wartime situations or, or, you know, situations that involve pain and suffering, what's their moral responsibility actually to intervene? And I think that a lot of photographers really wrestle with this um, and have wrestled with it because the sense that you're, you're watching pain and you're filming it or photographing it, is that, is that where your responsibility ends? And so uh, Susan Sontag actually has a really great book regarding the pain of others, which is, which is all about this, which is all about um, both the responsibility the photographer has in taking the photo and we as viewers have in viewing the pain of others. At what point does it, is action actually necessary? I'll just use one example of an iconic photograph where we do see the photographers making a clear decision to intervene. And I'm sure you all uh, know that, that very famous photograph from the Vietnam War of the Napalm Village and the young girl Who's, who's running down the street, screaming, crying, her clothes have been burned off and the photograph is taken. What you don't see is that right after that, the film crews and the photographers that, that documented that moment put their, their apparatus down, ran over to her, uh, uh, poured water on her, and in fact, she was immediately medevaced uh, to the hospital. And it's an it's an actually a case in which uh, people feel that the fact that she was photographed actually saved her life because she was immediately taken to a U.S. military hospital and given care. So we don't always see that, but I think that that's at least one example where we see a group of photographers making a really clear decision to intervene here. Um, now, the second question here about in studying the past, are we not always conditioned to reflect our present ideas onto that past, therefore changing the meaning of what was written or imagined at that time? Absolutely, absolutely. And this is where, in a sense, pictures never speak for themselves. Um, it's important for us, obviously, I believe through this lecture to understand the intent of the photographer, but we are not bound to uh, agree with that intent or or really uh, be, uh, react to the photograph in exactly the same way. The way that photographs are contextualized both within the larger historical moment, the text that we use, the values that we that we have, all of those are going to change a photograph's meaning. And so that really makes it a piece of historical evidence, like every piece of historical evidence, because a written text goes through exactly the same sort of um, alterations over time in terms of interpretation. And I'll, I guess I'll say it's what keeps people like me in business, because uh, sometimes I actually, I remember having conversations with my small children where they would ask me, um, I mean, don't we just know history already? Isn't it already written down? And of course, the answer is no, because we are always asking different questions of the past and those questions reflect our concerns at the moment. So in that sense, the photographs I think are just like every piece of historical evidence that we, um, that we, that we, that we have. Uh, next question I'm sort of racing through here. Can a photographer's presence during a potential historical event alter the outcome of the event or change its historical meaning? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, people knew that they were performing for the camera. They knew that they were being watched as we could see um, in the example I gave of, of Birmingham, the, the idea that there would be cameras there was part of the strategy of how the march was organized. It was, it was knowing that the cameras were going to be there that was very much in the forefront of organizers' minds. And there's no doubt that, that the presence of a camera can cause people to behave differently, sometimes better and sometimes worse. Um, not to get into too much of present day politics, but uh, one of the questions here was, you know, we lost the moment of the iconic photograph we may have, but we certainly haven't lost the moment in which images are, are saturating our understanding of current events and, and the world. And we see that, that in many respects, um, when reporters are on the scene, when cameras are on the scene, um, this can cause people to, to act quite differently. So, so this is 
probably one of the reasons why I think reinserting the presence of authorship into these photographs is so important because these photographs are not, it's not just a machine taking a snapshot of, of the past in this kind of unfiltered, unadulterated way that, that therefore makes that photograph truthful. And this is, I know, again, with my students, something that's so hard for them to get over, the idea that there's a picture, okay, that's fact, but a text, oh, that's interpretation. And to really just to constantly remind ourselves that, in fact, authorship is there. And so in, in that sense, uh, these, are, these have to be understood just like, just like other pieces of historical evidence here. Uh, I like the question, up until the 1930s, photo subjects did not seem to smile. Why, why not? Well, that, that really had to do with the technology. Um, the, it, it was a longer exposure time. So people, if you moved, uh, that, that could create blurry images. So this was one of the reasons. Um, the second was just convention. I mean, what what different co what conventions do we have in terms of taking uh, photographs? I, I you know we uh, at my college we have a college Instagram site, and a lot of our students post in Instagram selfies, and you can see the sort of um, uh, accepted practice of what a selfie is supposed to look like um, in the way that the students pose themselves. And I think that there's a lot of that um, in an earlier era, the idea of smiling all the time in, in photographs was not, was just not a, a cultural practice. So it's both the technology and it's also the cultural norms that we're, that we're seeing here. Um, Jacob Reese. Jacob Reese is a very difficult person to nail down. Uh, I, I definitely agree with the commentator here that he was a muckraker, muckraker who believed that large trust banks and robber barons um, bore a large responsibility for the poverty that he was seeing. But he was not somebody who um, who was above uh, assigning uh, blame to the individuals involved. If you read how the other half lives, you will see that he really he really stratified. Uh, stratifies the, the poor. He he does believe there's a certain group of poor that are so far down that there's really very little that can be done to help them. And he also, speaking back to the earlier question about our how our, our our cultural ideas change, he has he has very distinctive ideas about different ethnic groups, which in his parlance are different racial groups, and really talks in, in highly stereotyped languages about the racial characteristics of Italians and Bohemians and Poles and Jews. Um, and, and in that sense is very much a man of his time. So his emphasis is on improving the environment and helping the honest poor, but he does make a distinction between the honest poor and those, and those people who he feels are beyond redemption, thus opening the door to some individual um, responsibility in terms, of, in terms of how to pull out of the, out of, out of the poverty that, um, that we see. So it's structural in his mind, but there's also an element for personal um, and in a sense, uh, cultural uh, traits as well. Uh, let's see, let's see. Oh, how did on the earth did the investigator find migrant mother? She was actually, this story was actually in the 1970s. Her name was Florence, uh, Florence uh, Thompson. And I'm not, I, I can't, I actually don't know for sure. I'm going to say good investigative reporting. She had written letters to different newspapers when they had published Migrant Mother asking them to not publish it. So she had self-identified herself in a, at a few different moments before then. Uh, but, uh, but that's a good question. And I feel like I need to find out, I need to find out the answer to that one here. Uh, let's see, iconic photographs by women. The, the person I'd probably uh, put back in here if I was, uh, if I had more time would probably be uh, Margaret Bork White. I think she's another uh, very well-known uh, female photographer, especially for World War II. Took a lot of iconic images of liberation of the, um, the, the concentration camps that, we, that we're very familiar with and certainly uh, right there in the thick of theme things uh, during the conflict. So she's probably the other really prominent female photographer where we would we would recognize the photographs that she's uh, that she's she's taking. Um, 
And oh, wow, just another great question. How do you balance the control between photographer and editors changing and uses of the product? Absolutely. There were many photographers. I think we saw that with the Rosenthal one, he never even saw the, saw the photographs. He had his film. He sent it off to be developed to Guam. He didn't know which photograph they had chosen to, to publish. And so when he was asked about the photographs, actually said yes that he had posed it when in fact because they thought they were talking about something else the cropping the the photographs that are selected to use the captioning of the of the photographs these are often things that are outside of the photographer's control dorothea lang was working for the farm security administration she turned those photographs over these were not her photographs she in fact never her reputation was enhanced by them but she did not own them she didn't have any control over how they were published and how they were disseminated Interesting story about Dorothea Lang. She also took pictures of Manzanar, but her pictures of Manzanar were much harsher than the one Ansel Adams um, took, and they were censored. They were never saw the light of day uh, during the Second World War or afterwards. They're sort of just been recently rediscovered. So, so who's paying you to take the photographs? The the the, the press, the the editors have a lot of control at the moment about what those photographs mean. But what I think is interesting in a historical sense is all that falls away. So now when we see Migrant Mother, we never actually see the way it was originally published. In fact, I did a research project a few years ago. Where I got super curious to think, well, well what, how did it appear in the newspaper? And went back and looked at the original um, picture and the captioning and the stories that accompanied it. And it's very specific and it's actually kind of grainy, not even a great reproduction. And now, you know, years later, we forget all of that. It's just the image itself that's available to us for us to overlay our own understandings and, and interpretations. And so really, if you think about it, the photographer uh, in many cases loses control of, of the interpretation of an image very, very, very quickly there. Uh, oh. Oh, okay. So Eddie Adams, what was Adams really wanting to show in the shooting uh, photograph? You know, that's a great question. I think that he was, if you look at that roll of film and you see what he was doing, first of all, I don't think he knew what was going to happen. I don't think he, I don't think he knew that this man was about to be shot right, right in, right in front of him. And he was in the moment sort of taking these photographs It's sort of a similar situation of taking them and then um, turning this for turning the film over. And then of course, this is this iconic image is the one that's selected and actually, and actually shown. I think that in his mind, he was and troubled about that initially because the idea was that this was um, showing the um, execution of, of an enemy an, an enemy guerrilla who was responsible for the deaths of men on, on our side and our allies' side. And that in a sense, this was, this was grisly, but it wasn't necessarily something that uh, he expected to impact public opinion as much as it did. And of course, one of the reasons it impacted public opinion so much was because the Tet Offensive was largely, um, many Americans largely concluded that uh, the Tet Offensive demonstrated that Vietnam was unwinnable. Uh, the president, uh, Lyndon Johnson said, I'm not running for reelection, I'm gonna negotiate a peace. I mean, there was a lot a lot of the, the political context that made that, that photograph resonate the way that it did. If you took that photograph and put it in a, in a different context, um, and, and relabeled the individuals, we might not see the same kind of reaction on, on the part of, of the American public. So that is one where really the understanding the historical moment is absolutely es essential to really seeing the kind of impact that it, that it had. All right, um, that's it for time. So thanks so much for listening. I hope you found it engaging and instructive and boy, really great questions, really great questions. Thanks so much.